need that. We, we've been looking at convictions, uh, just some areas of taking a stand in the, the things of, of Scripture. Uh, we looked first at the fact that God alone is sovereign. Because of that, since the Bible is His inspired word, it's the final authority for my life. That's, that's a great conviction. That's the beginning. Uh, secondly, we looked at my purpose in life is to seek God with my whole heart and build my life around His priorities. Then we looked at my body as the living temple of God and must not be defiled by the lusts of the world. Uh, we need to have a conviction about uh, our, our, the physical temple that God has given to us. Last week we looked at my church. Basically it must be scriptural and so should I. <laughs> and then tonight we're, we're looking at children. Uh, number five, my children belong to God and it's my responsibility to teach them scriptural principles, godly character, and basic convictions. And you might think, well, I don't have any children or my children are grown or whatever. We can still apply this, uh, this conviction. It, there's, there's a lot said in the book of Proverbs, for instance, uh, about raising children, family. I hope that you read the book of Proverbs, and I hope that you stop every once in a while and think about one. <laughs> you know, let, uh, let the Lord speak to your heart. Uh, for instance, in Proverbs 29, he says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Uh, we're seeing that a lot in the community nowadays, aren't we? Uh, another one is, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. And let me say as well, you correct your children, it'll give them rest too. You know, they, they won't, they'll just be a lot more calm. Uh, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 127. Let's read that just to uh, give us a place to start tonight. Psalm 127, probably a familiar psalm to you. And then we're going to go to the book of 1 Samuel. We're kind of taking a negative approach tonight. Um, I don't apologize for that, but uh, you'll, you'll see what I, well, you can see from the notes there. Psalm 127, I've preached this Mother's Days, I've preached this Father's Days, <laughs> it's a great portion of scripture, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I'm not sure how many is a full quiver. I think somebody said seven. Um, I guess we never got our quiver quite full. But uh, I can say this, children, children are a blessing. And uh, children are also a challenge. Uh, I know, I've been one. Um, Children are of the Lord, he says there, and uh, we need to realize that. You know, the world takes the attitude, if we don't want them, we'll just kill them. It's getting pretty scary. Um, I'm getting up there in age, and, you know, we're, they're getting to the point where they're going to say, you're too old, we're going to kill you. Or, we don't like the way you look, we're going to kill you. And anyway, I don't want to get off the subject, but uh, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. Getting wound up there. Samuel chapter 1. And I want to look at Samuel, but even more Eli. 1 Samuel chapter 1, um, the end of, of verse 6, it tells us about that the Lord had shut up her womb. You know, when, you, when you read that, children are of the Lord, whether we have children or not is of the Lord. Uh, the Lord had shut up her womb. But then in, in verse 19, the end of verse 19, it says, The Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Uh, so God gave Hannah a son. And then we reread later, she, he gives her uh, other children as well. God gave her a son. And the Bible says that she gave him back to God. In chapter 1, verse 28, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. Now, I don't understand this uh, completely, but she, she took him when, he, when Samuel was weaned, she took him to the temple and gave him to Eli to raise. <laughs> that, that seems strange to me. I don't understand how that all worked, but uh, it's true. 
and that God was in it. And as, as Samuel was given over to Eli, Eli was the high priest, I want us to look at the situation that he steps into. Well, toddles into, <laughs> I guess. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, let me give you uh, God's description of Eli's sons. Now, these were grown men at this point. 1 Samuel 2, starting in verse 12. It doesn't start off very good. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servants came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh and all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I'll take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men ab abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Um, go down to verse 22. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Now, what I want you to see, one, one of the things I want you to see, Samuel was in a dangerous place. <laughs> uh, these were, were not good men, Eli's sons. And uh, we need to realize, uh, just because we're in a spiritual place, a church, a Christian school, and so on, uh, it can still be dangerous. Uh, the devil entered Judas in the upper room. Hannah was a woman of prayer. You'll, you'll see that if you read chapter 1. She needed to be for Samuel's sake. And listen, we need to be for our, our children and, and for our country. Uh, don't stop praying for your children just because they're in a Christian environment. Uh, many a person has fallen, uh, like Eli's sons. Did you see that description there in verse 12 of, of chapter 2? He says they were, they were sons of Belial. That means they were followers of wickedness. Then he, he says, they knew not the Lord. These were non-believers, just like most churches today. <laughs> you know, a lot of the religious leadership of our day, uh, they don't know the Lord. You know, it's just a job. It's just a business. That was these guys, and they were in it for what they could get out of it. Verses 13 to, through 17, they're basically just saying that they were openly sacrilegious. Uh, they were taking stuff out of the offerings and sacrifices that, that they had no business doing. And if somebody said, oh, make sure you sacrifice this right, they'd say, well, give it to me or I'll beat you up. They must have been strong young men. And then in verse 22, it says they were openly immoral. Uh, they lay with the different women, forcing themselves on, on religious women. And uh, the end of it was that, uh, end of verse 17, men abhorred the offering of the Lord. They made people hate doing what God had told them to do. And in, in verse 24, uh, he said, you make the Lord's people to transgress, leading other people astray. Uh, so you see some things here about Eli's sons. Uh, the thing I want us to look at is, how did they end up this way? Uh, surely Eli knew what was right. I think he did. But the thing that makes this, uh, helps us to understand it, is seeing how God describes Eli's sins. Look in, in chapter 2, in verse 27. Let's see something here. He says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer up, to, I'm sorry, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? 
And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. I'll just stop reading there. You begin to see something about Eli. It makes a, a startling statement to me. It says that Eli kicked at my sacrifice and my offering. Now, I know what, what that would mean, you know, if, if we said it today. And it means pretty much the same thing. It meant he despised or, or trampled on uh, the things of God. I don't understand that completely, but basically it's saying his heart was not right. I think he outwardly was probably doing the right things, but he didn't have a heart for it. And secondly, it says he honored his sons above God. Well, I've seen that a lot, uh, where people honor their family or, or different ones uh, above the Lord. And I, th I think Eli probably had some godly qualities, but the effect of his sin outweighed them all. And, you know, that's the way sin is. We tend to look at our good qualities. You know, we say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good in most, most cases. God looks at our sin. <laughs> and, and he, you know, the Bible says, be sure your, your sin will find you out. You know, we kind of think of life like a, you know, a, an orange cut in half. You know, got all these compartments. We think, well, I'm pretty good in most of my compartments. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you get an orange and uh, there's a rotten part in, in one of the compartments, you have a rotten orange. All right? And uh, we need to understand that. Eli had, had some godly qualities, but uh, his sin outweighed them. You know, when you think about the family, uh, when parents rebel secretly, oftentimes their children will, will rebel openly. It's amazing how uh, uh, our family can see our heart more than we, we think. Uh, what parents allow in moderation, oftentimes their children will do in excess. You know, the, the world is trying to get people to control alcohol. You, you see the ads and different things, and it just doesn't work that way. Um, what parents hint at in the home is often a more effective sermon than they'll ever hear at church. You know, they, they learn things as they go along. The Bible says that he kicked at the sacrifices and offerings. That was in his heart. He honored his sons above God. Now, that would have come out in a lot of ways. And then chapter 3, verse 13 it says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Uh, he didn't restrain them. The interesting part of this situation is he was not only their father, he, had, he, he was also their boss. You know, they were priests working under his, his leadership. But the end result was the end of his priesthood. Uh, 1 Samuel 2, verse 30 we read 29, verse 30. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in, in thine house. Now, God is, is going to bring Eli's priesthood to an end. Now look at verse 34. This shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, that's, that's their names. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Now God was already raising up Samuel. Now, while I'm preaching tonight, I may get their names backwards and you just figure out what I'm talking about. But uh, Eli's priesthood came to an end. Uh, it, was begin it was coming to an end uh, because of, of his sin. Uh, God is beginning to speak to Samuel. Uh, I don't know if you noticed as we read there in chapter 2, uh, verse 18, Samuel ministered before the Lord. Uh, verse 26, the child Samuel grew on and was in favor, both with the Lord and also with men. He was doing right before God and, and doing right before man. Um, and, and the interesting thing is that Eli points Samuel to the Lord. He failed his own sons, but he reaches Hannah's son. When we believed that God had called us to Australia, 
uh, we were pretty young. We had uh, two very young children. And uh, we just determined that we didn't want to try and reach people of, a, of Australia and lose our own children. Uh, we, we believed and we practiced that that was a, a top priority was that our main ministry was, was to our children. And, and somehow, Eli missed that. Um, you know, I don't know what his home situation was or anything, but um, e Eli somehow was able to point Samuel to the Lord, but he hadn't pointed his own children to the Lord. And God gives Eli a message through Samuel. You, you probably know this, this part of the story where, where Samuel is lying down to go to sleep. He's still a young, young fella. And the Lord says, Samuel. <laughs> and he thinks that it's, it's uh, Eli calling. So he runs into Eli. You called? I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. It happens, I think, three times. And, and the last time, let's see, in, in verse uh, 11, or no, verse, verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. He arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And that's exactly what happened. And God gave Samuel a message. Uh, look in uh, verse 11. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Therefore have I, I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. It was too late to, uh, to, to take care of it. Uh, the, the die was set. Eli's response when uh, Samuel told him, you know, the next morning, Eli said, what, what did God say? And he, he just, he told him, verse 18, Samuel told him every whit. He had nothing from him. And here's Eli's response. It is the Lord. Let him do that which seemeth him good. And he was resigned to it. He might as well be. It was, it was going to happen. Eli basically experienced the Old Testament equivalent of 1 Timothy 3.5. Uh, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Uh, Proverbs 29, where we, we read, A child left to himself bringeth his mother or his father uh, to shame. And uh, that's what happened in, in Eli's life. Well, what can we learn from this? You know, this conviction that, that we're talking about, uh, the, the idea that my children belong to God, uh, and my responsibility is to teach them scriptural principles, godly character, uh, basic convictions. Uh, one of the things we need to, to learn from this is never underestimate the power of sin. You know, we have a, a saying here, she'll be right. <laughs> but it isn't always right. Sometimes we think, oh, I can, I can uh, let this slip or that slide or do this wrong and that wrong, and it, it'll probably be all right. You know, Hophni and Phinehas grew up in the priest's home. The, the Bible description of them is awful, isn't it? Sons of Belial. And... I believe that came uh, because of their father, because of Eli. And, you know, as parents, we have a responsibility to our children. Number one, we need to learn to obey God's word. You know, our, our children are watching. And uh, not just our children, you know, the world is watching. God is watching. We need to learn to obey God's word. And that means there's times when we, we have to restrain ourselves. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be things we're going to want to do. And sometimes they're not even things that are sin in themselves, but they head the wrong direction. They're going to they're gonna take us the wrong way. But particularly when it, when it comes to doing right, uh, we've, we've got to set an example. Don't teach from hypocrisy. I've heard people say, oh, those are adult words, son. Uh, we can say those. You can't say those. Listen, if it's wrong, it's wrong. Uh, don't teach from hypocrisy. The, the standard God gives us... Uh, it's in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, God's standard is, is, is righteousness. Let me read you the verses before that. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end 
for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. That's what he's saying. Uh, have a righteous standard. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, in, in, your, in your way of life. Do your best to, to see what God would have you to do and, and to do it. God gives us a standard to live to. He also gives us the ability to do so. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's, it's just amazing you know, that God would, would call us to this high standard, but He doesn't just leave us alone. He goes with us. He goes in us, and uh, He helps us. One of the things I've found helpful is to recognize who you are in Christ. I've got some handouts somewhere. I think they're in the back there if you want them afterwards. Just a list of things you know, that, that uh, different ones have picked out and uh, you can find in the Scripture where, where God describes what you are in Him. And that helps you uh, to know that God has, has done something in your life. So don't underestimate the power of sin. Secondly, don't wait until it's too late. Uh, the Bible says uh, a couple of verses here, Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. <laughs> he, he doesn't say, train up an old child. He says, train up a child, and when they're old, they'll, they'll know what they're doing. Proverbs 13, 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. That's an old word that just means early. Uh, the time to chasten our children uh, is not when they're adults, it's when they're children. That was the difference between Eli's sons and Samuel. Samuel was trained early. Isn't it interesting how sometimes we'll do the right thing when it's outside of our home, but we won't do the right thing in our home. I guess that's what, what Eli did. He, he seems to have trained Samuel early, but not his sons. And then it was too late for Eli to train his sons. God had to step in. And uh, man, that's, uh, that's not the place where you want to be. You, you know, our children, their hope is not in us. Their hope is in the Lord. And really what we're trying to do as, as parents is to turn their hand over to the Lord. We don't want to be holding their hand all their life. Now, there's special instances, you know, if a child is retarded or uh, something like that, then they're a child all their life. Um, we don't want our children to be under our thumb all their life. If they don't become functioning adults, we haven't done our job right. We had a lady in our church who used to call her daughter every morning to make sure she was up for work. Her daughter was only 45. Now, that's not right. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about when I was a child, I spake as a child, and so on. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Uh, there's a difference between a, a child and, and an adult. And with our children, it's an ever-changing relationship. Uh, there's discipline. Uh, there's training. You know, there's a time when you need to train your children how to do things. There's a time when you'll be like a coach to them. But it should lead to a point where you're equals. And you can have a friendship. But I can guarantee you, if you don't, if you don't discipline when, when they're 0 to 5, and if you don't train them when they're 5 to 15 and whatever, uh, you won't have a friendship when they're 20 to 30 and 40. It might come back later uh, if you can work it out. But uh, God wants us to bring our children to Him. You know, Hannah lent her child to the Lord. Now, that was a little one. But particularly as they grow to adults, we want our children to become adults and be in submission to God, not to us. Not to us. Uh, never underestimate the power of sin. Don't wait till it's too late. And then thirdly, honor God above every person, every purpose or possession, family included. You know, sometimes it's, we can learn a principle, but we don't apply it evenly. And we think, yeah, God is above all except <laughs> this situation with my children or this. Uh, we need to honor God above everyone. Do you remember 1 Samuel 2.29, what he said? Um, how, how Eli kicked at his offerings and honored his sons above God? Uh, that was wrong. We need to give God the glory. The Bible says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And the reason we do that is because He's worthy. 
The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. It, it's all about God. Give Him the glory. He's worthy. Colossians 1.18 says that in all things He might have the preeminence. In my life, in my family, in my work, uh, everything I do. Do you remember God's word to Eli there in, in verse 30? For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now, I know there's plenty of people in the world that lightly esteem me. <laughs> Go door knocking. It's very good for your humility. Um, but I don't want God to lightly esteem me. I don't want God to, do, you know, to be, be finished with me. Uh, you know, there's, there's people who will treat you like dirt. But God knows you and, and loves you. And if you'll yield to Him, uh, he'll, he'll honor. He'll honor you. Them that honor me, I will honor, He says. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And when we come to this, this conviction, honor is such a, an important thing in the home. Treating each other with respect. Uh, used to have a little book, you know, the best thing you can do for your, your children. I can't remember the exact title of it, but... It was basically saying the best thing you can do for your children, husbands, is to love your wife. Best thing you can do. That'll help them. If they'll see you honoring your wife, uh, that'll help them. And uh, as children, we're taught to honor our parents. As parents, we should, in a sense, honor who our children are before God. Uh, my children belong to God, and it's my responsibility to teach them scriptural principles, godly character, and basic convictions. Now, whether you have children or not, some of you are pre-child, some of you are post-child, um, some of you just never have had children. You still need to learn scriptural principles. You still need to learn godly character. You still need to learn basic convictions and live them. <laughs> now, you may not have children to teach them to, but hey, God can, can give you influence. God gives you influence with people. And what you are is what people will see. The real you will come out. You can teach them to others. We don't have to have children to live this, this concept. But it, when we do, it's, it's so important. You know, it, it's amazing how quickly raising children gets over. Um, I, have, I have children that are old. <laughs> um, it's, it's just interesting how, how time goes on. And it, it seems to last forever when you're raising kids. I mean, you spend a few sleepless nights and that, and it, it seems like a, a long time, but man, when you look back, it, it's gone. Uh, make sure you, you seek out what the Lord would, would have you to do. And uh, just trust Him for, for what He will do. We're going to sing a, a, a song tonight. It's in... Okay, the hymnals are around. It's, it's number 90, More Love to Thee.